Well, I guess we're right at the hour here. So good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the opening of this year's Great Decision Speaker Series that we are extremely happy about and excited about. We are very pleased to see so many of you here today locally in St. Louis and also um, our listeners from across the United States and from a few overseas locations as we have seen the registrations for today. So it's great to see our fan base grow. My name is Liana Constantine. I'm the executive director of OMSO Global, which is the international office of the University of Missouri, St. Louis. I'm also a board member of the World Affairs Council, St. Louis. And I'm here with my colleague, says George, from the World Affairs Council. And another board member, Joel Glassman, from the World Affairs Council. I think this is a perfect combination for this uh, event series also. So how so? Uh, the Great Decision Speaker Series is an initiative of the Foreign Policy Association. It is sponsored locally by the World Affairs Council St. Louis and also by AMSO. In fact, AMSO Global has been a partner of the speaker series for many years. And uh, we are really uh, excited to have a great set of events ready for you again for this spring. Um, I'm sure the World Affairs Council and then also our AMSO Global team will call, uh, keep all of you informed about the uh, coming um spring the uh, different events that we have. So, but before we go into that, uh, please allow me a few remarks uh, on the tradition of the speaker series. Great Decisions is an initiative of the Foreign Policy Association, as I just said, and the first Great Decisions group was launched in Portland, Oregon as early as 1954, which I find amazing. It was based on a face-to-face -face model facilitating active and for informal conversation. So meanwhile, Great Decisions has developed into the largest US-based discussion program about foreign policy. It provides an opportunity for US audiences to learn about complex foreign policy issues um, and to understand the, essential, uh, the essentials of a democratic society. As many of our frequent uh, followers know, the World Affairs Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with local chapters across the United States. It is also a membership-based organization that connects each local chapter with the world. And founded in 1948, its mission is to offer programs which promote understanding, engagement, relationships, and leadership of world affairs. So uh, our team here will actually put the membership uh, link for all of you in the chat box in a little while. And if we have any students uh, in the area, not just AMSO students, but everybody, all students, we will um, assist you further if you are interested in a membership for students with the World Affairs Council. So back to the mission and objectives of our Great Decision Speaker Series. Uh, providing a space for discussing international topics. Well, I believe we have a uh, great reason to be proud of our continuous engagement in that area. And we see a very active and creative uh, membership base here in St. Louis. As a matter of fact, many, many speakers volunteer their time and knowledge to us. And uh, as do moderators oftentimes, and the fleet of volunteers helping us uh, identify the best setup for each topic that we cover. So each of our events, including the one today, is a set topic predetermined by the experts of the Foreign Policy Association. So you can assume actually that this particular topic or each topic that we will offer will also be covered somehow at the other uh, locations in the United States that partner with for, with the Foreign Policy Association. I find that pretty neat to, um, uh, to imagine that. So um, before I hand it over to my colleagues here, I would like to introduce and thank our moderator of the speaker series. We have one moderator for the entire uh, uh, speaker series this time. This is Dr. Stephen Bagwell. Dr. Bagwell is an assistant professor for political science at our university here at AMSO. And uh, his research focus is on political economy, human rights, and political violence. So my personal observation is that he is a citizen of the world and very generous about sharing his academic interests and passion. 
and Dr. Bagwell will be your best companion throughout the speaker series. So with this, I hand it over to Seth, I guess, or to Stephen. <laughs> Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm Stephen Bagwell. I am thrilled to be the moderator for this uh, semester's events. Um, it is a great pleasure of mine to introduce uh, Professor J.D. Bowen, who is an associate professor and chair of the political science department at St. Louis University, where he has served in that capacity since 2008. His research focuses on political institutions, economic policy and economic development in Latin America. He's recently been studying how different governments in the region have responded to both the health and the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. He has lived and conducted research primarily in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Bowen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. Let me see if I can uh, get my screen up here. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here to speak with you today. Um, and as Stephen mentioned, my expertise um, is in Latin American politics. Um, particularly South America. Um, so I'm going to talk maybe a, a little bit more on, on that side of the, the hemisphere, um, but happy to take questions about other parts um, if, if that's what folks are interested in. Um, so I, I want to, at least for a while, stay a little bit close to what that Great Decisions um, book was talking about and thinking about kind of swings between um, left-wing and right-wing governments in the region, um, because there, there, there does seem to be kind of a general tendency um, for countries as a group to kind of swing back and forth between different political poles, I guess. Um, but also, as we know, in the US, it's kind of confusing or, or not always very illuminating um, to talk in broad terms about what's on the left and what's on the right. Um, so I just want to take a couple of minutes to kind of put some, uh, um, I guess, definitions or, or concepts on things so that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so when we think about kind of left wing governments or right wing governments, um, I tend to think of it in with two questions. One is, you know, what do leaders want, right? What are their kind of policy orientations? What are the big ideas? What do they want to achieve? And then secondly, what resources do they have um, with which to get that, right? Um, political resources, right? Do they control Congress? Do they have support in the military? Do they have support amongst the lobbyist and interest groups? Those sorts of things. Um, and also economic resources, right? Particularly when we talk about um, left-wing or progressive governments, these often involve governments that want to do things like build more housing, build more schools, hire more um, workers, um, do things that cost money, right? So obviously that's easier to do when you have more economic resources. Um, but so I'm gonna think about things kind of in, in that framework, right? What do leaders want and what resources do they have uh, to get them? So when we talk about particularly left-wing governments, since that's most of whom is in power in the region today, um, I want to think about kind of what they have in common, right? Because we'll talk more about what they don't have in common. Um, but I, I think when we talk about the left or progressive governments, um, we can think about a couple of things here, right? These are governments um, that really focus on the importance of addressing um, historic inequalities, um, you know, kind of big structural inequalities through the redistribution of economic and political resources. And that the second point, that the state should be the agent doing that, right? It, it is the government's right and proper job um, to redistribute economic and political power in society. Um, this is particularly relevant in many Latin American countries because this is one of the most unequal regions of the world, right? There's tremendous wealth in this part of the world, but there's also tremendous poverty. So when we talk about leftist governments, um, again, I'm kind of thinking in this vein, governments that see their role as directly addressing these big inequalities in society and of using the institutions of government to do that. Um, the flip side of that is the conservative critique, right? When we talk about right-wing or conservative governments, um, there are various critiques of what the left is looking to do and how it's looking to do it. Um, you know, the first would be a, a perspective that kind of shares the goals, shares the, the big ideas of the left, which is that there are big inequalities that need to be addressed um, but the conservative critique would be that government is not the tool to do that, right? The, the best, most efficient way to address inequalities um, is through the private sector, through private charity. Um, so kind of the old argument that, uh, you know, the best welfare plan is a good job at a thriving company, right? Um, we shouldn't be focusing on the role of government in redistributing wealth and power. We should focus on the private sector um, as, as the, the, the set of institutions that can achieve that goal. Um, 
A second critique that kind of moves maybe a bit away from the overarching goal of redistribution um, is the critique that the market should be the determining factor in how um, economic and political resources are distributed, right? That there may simply be inequalities in society due to market forces, due to economic forces, um, and it's not the job of government uh, to intervene in that, that those types of inequalities are reasonable and legitimate, um, and, and we should allow them to exist, right? It should not be the role of government to intervene there. Um, and then the third critique, I think, is more of an old school, traditional one that um, is kind of slowly going out of, of favor, um, although I think there is still a powerful constituency for this in some Latin American countries, um, that sees inequalities as, in many cases, natural and correct, right? And this is kind of, um, for example, in the U.S., the old, old, old uh, uh, conservative critique, for example, in the Jim Crow South, right, that there are racial hierarchies um, that are just natural and correct, and it is not, if anything, it's the job of government to reinforce those hierarchies, um, or kind of gender hierarchies, those sorts of things, right? Um, so again, that's kind of a, a different moral or maybe even immoral critique um, of, of the leftist position, um, but it is one that is not has not completely disappeared. So I think it's important to kind of keep it in mind that it is a set of ideas that are out there. Um, some history here very quickly. Um, if we're gonna think about these swings back and forth between the left and the right, um, if we go back to the 1980s and 1990s, um, I put here, you know, everyone was a conservative. Um, even if people campaigned as leftist or as populist or whatever you wanna call them, even as socialists, um, the fact is that democratic governments were mostly new, right? Up to this point, most of the governments in Latin America had been um, military regimes or other sorts of, of dictatorial regimes. Um, so democratic government was new and fragile and governments were broke. Um, many of the military governments that ran the region in the 1970s um, may have been very good at security and stability and the types of things militaries are often good at. Um, they were not good at economic management. And so many of these new economic governments came into power um, already deeply in debt, um, high unemployment, high inflation, um, budget deficits, right? Huge economic problems. And so you know, any of these promises about more housing, more hospitals, more schools, more spending um, was really, really hard to, um, to push forward simply because there were no resources, right? Um, the 80s and into the 90s is really an era of debt crisis. And right? so governments are, are retrenching economically. So again, no matter how people campaigned, no matter what their ideology was, um, at the end of the day, almost everyone ended up being a conservative by default. Um, we move forward into the 2000s. Um, the, the chapter in the Great Decisions book talks a little bit about this. We see a kind of two left-wing types of governments emerge, um, kind of more populist government and more social democratic government, um, and a few intermediate cases. Um, and a lot of this variation here is because the economic conditions in the region had changed. If the 80s and 90s are about um, kind of debt crisis and austerity and, and retrenchment, um, the 2000s is the era of a commodities boom. So most of the countries in the region are still big producers of um, natural resources, minerals, um, oil, natural gas, copper, tin, aluminum, um, all sorts of natural resources, um, also agricultural products, right? If we look at countries like Brazil and Argentina, um, these are countries that compete favorably even with big ag here in the Midwest, right? These are, are, are world-class agricultural producers, right? Um, and so here back to this idea of what do governments want and, and do they have the resources to get it? Um, in many countries by the 2000s, um, they, the answer to that second question is, yeah, they have the resources to get it. Um, countries had, governments had money to spend, right? And so, um, you start to see a kind of a, a divergence of left-wing governments in terms of what their priorities are and how they use those resources. Um, kind of inevitably, the pendulum then swings back to the right um, by the mid-2000s. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and here, we, again, we kind of see a, a separation between um, a kind of populist right. We can think about um, President Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, who just recently left office. Um, and a more um, kind of conservative democratic right. Here I'm thinking of someone like the Chilean, recent Chilean president, Sebastián Piñera. Um, I think of him as kind of a, a Mitt Romney type, if you will, right? A conservative businessman, um, but not a bomb thrower, right? Not a, not a um, you know, a loud populist type of, of leader. Um, but the concern here for these governments was that commodities boom of the early 2000s is largely over, 
um, by the time those those more conservative governments come to power. Um, so again, they may have lots of new ideas, but they don't have much money at that point, right? They come to power in the midst of, of a region-wide economic downturn. So um, that's a, a kind of quick and dirty history. Um, if we jump up into today, what's, you know, how do we summarize 2023? I say in four bullet points. Um, the first uh, comes from that great decision chapter. Um, really, we're looking at three different types of left-wing governments. We're looking at dictatorships, we're looking at populist democracies, and we're looking at social democracies. I'll talk about each of them. Um, we're looking at governments that now have fewer economic resources. So when the left was last in power 15 or 20 years ago, they had a lot of money to spend. Um, today, in general, they have far less. Um, I guess the logical corollary of the left being in power is this third point that conservatives are regrouping um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, right wing parties and conservative groups are out of power right now. Um, so what are they doing? And then fourth um, is what I call kind of chaos countries. There are a couple of countries in the region um, that are um, just kind of a political and economic mess. And I want to take a minute to talk about why that is. I'm thinking particularly about Venezuela um, on the economic front. Um, and Peru more on the political front, um, a country that has just continuously cycled through new presidents over the years. So um, if we just start kind of moving through those four points, uh, we start looking at the leftist dictators. Um, here you've got on the left, Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, uh, Miguel Diaz-Canel, the current leader of Cuba, and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Um, and again, we kind of call these dictatorships, I put it in quotation marks, um, because to my mind, they're not exactly the same, right? If we look at who these leaders are, um, Cuba, I'm guessing most of you are, are, are familiar with the Cuban government to one extent or another, simply because it's been around forever. Um, this is just an old school Stalinist dictatorship, right? This is uh, the old Soviet Union model um, transferred over to the Caribbean, right? And so just an old kind of classic communist regime, not much has changed. Um, when we look at Venezuela and Nicaragua, it looks a little bit different. Um, these were originally democratically elected leaders, um, elected through, um, or at least the, the, the regimes that they came with were elected through um, reasonably democratic elections, right? And nothing in the world is perfect, um, but they were democratically elected leaders who were then able to consolidate power and silence their opposition, right? So these are governments that came to power democratically and then gradually, year after year, decade after decade, strangled democracy. What do these governments have in common? Um, they've consolidated power with a mix of political and economic resources, right? In Cuba, it's the Communist Party and the military. Um, in Venezuela and Nicaragua, um, it's kind of some combination of the military, a political party. Um, actually, in the case of Nicaragua, early on, it was a lot of money coming in from Venezuela. So kind of a lot of outside support, right? And they remain in power simply by denying political resources to the opposition. Um, in some ways, particularly in the cases of Venezuela and Nicaragua, um, it's almost difficult to attach the, the leftist label to these governments um, because they, these really are, are, are leaders that are clinging to power, right? The idea that there's um, some ideology or some goal of redistribution uh, behind these governments is, is increasingly hard to sustain. These governments are in power for the sake of remaining in power, right? Um, so if at some point there, in the past there was a big ideological project they were trying to advance, um, that died a while ago. Um, along with democracy. So these are kind of the, 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 the governments that in different ways fall into the category of dictatorships. Um, then I want to shift over to, actually, before I move on, I want to say one more thing about the, the dictatorships. Um, if we look at those three countries, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, um, these are three countries that, at least in the past five years, um, in some cases much longer, have been hemorrhaging people, right? Economically, they are not in good shape and have not been for a while. Um, and so all three of these countries um, are actually losing population as for a variety of reasons, people leave those countries, right? Venez in Venezuela, um, just in the last five years, about 10% of the population has left um, because of the economic crisis in that country, right? Um, so these are countries that are struggling, not just politically in terms of democracy, um, but these are countries economically that are not doing well at all. Um, okay, then if we shift over to talk about um, what I would call kind of populist leftist governments. Um, there are two big ones in the region, Mexico and Argentina. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're populist for different reasons. Um, so when I talk about populist democracies, what I mean here is 
um, kind of governments and presidents with weak political institutions. So there are elections, they are mostly free and open and fair, people can run, there are political parties, um, they look like what you would expect from democratic elections. Um, but then once somebody is in power, the political institutions that would hold them accountable are really weak, right? So judicial systems often aren't able to stop them from doing whatever they want. Um, opposition political parties often struggle to hold them accountable, right? So you've got elections, um, but not much else in terms of democracy. And so it, I think in these two cases, we're looking at um, presidents and, and, and political parties that maybe are trying to consolidate power, right? Trying to do what the, the Venezuelan and Nicaraguan governments did in eliminating opposition, um, but just haven't been able to do it. And so in these environments, politics tends to fo follow kind of a boom bust cycle, um, right? These are both countries that depend a lot on commodities, oil, agricultural products. Uh, and so things that tend to fluctuate a lot in price over time. And so when times are good, they can spend a lot of money, they're very popular. Um, and then when prices turn, when the economic cycle turns against them, um, they're bankrupt, right? And, and things tend to fall apart and then the cycle starts over again. So if we look at these two countries separately, um, if we take Mexico first under their current president, um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, um, everybody just calls him by the, the four letters of his name, AMLO. Um, if we just look at what he's trying to do here, what he's been able to do, um, again, I'm oversimplifying here a, a little bit, um, but he's been fortunate in terms of, of recent Mexican presidents in that he has pretty substantial congressional majorities, right? So he's actually able to pass a lot of what he wants to do through Congress um, in a way that often other leaders um, throughout the region or throughout the world aren't able to do. Um, so he's been fortunate in that regard that he has support in key institutions. Um, the second point here is that he came into power in large part as a kind of outsider anti-corruption crusader. Right, I'm going to clean up Mexican politics. I'm going to drive out all of these corrupt elites. Um, and I think it's debatable how successful he's been, um, but it's certainly been popular. Right. So again, whether it's been very effective or not, I don't know. Um, I'm skeptical. Um, but in terms of a, a, a political project, it's a winner. Right. People people like it, or at least a, a majority of the population likes it. Um, the third part here, I think, to me, is more concerning. Right. He's used this popular support and he's used these congressional majorities to start to tinker with the rules of elections, to start to tinker with um, the rules of judicial appointments and, and how um, judges and courts operate. Um, the reason that I'm concerned about this is if we go back to those dictatorships and look at um, places like Venezuela and Nicaragua, um, this is where that started, right? We had leaders that came to power democratically. Um, they were very popular for a variety of reasons, in large part because they, they got lucky and governed at a time when there were a lot of resources. And so they started playing with the electoral rules to make them a little bit more favorable for them remaining in power. They started playing around with the judicial system um, to make sure that the things that they were doing didn't get overturned by judges. Um, and you know, every single act on its own um, wasn't all that scandalous. Um, but when we added up over you know, five or 10 years, we just see the gradual dismantling of democracy in these countries. And so I think a lot of Mexicans um, and a lot of people around the world are concerned that um, this looks like it could be the first step in moving in that direction. Um, now, I will say, I think Mexican political institutions are in far better shape than what existed in Venezuela and Nicaragua before. Um, but again, right, these first steps here look a lot like the first steps um, that leaders in Venezuela and Nicaragua were taking 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, so there's reason to pay attention, um, if nothing else. Argentina, on the other hand, looks different, right? And if in Mexico, we're talking about a single leader, um, AMLO, the current president, in Argentina, we're really looking at kind of a movement and a political party that has existed for 80 years. Um, the Peronist party named after um, President Juan Perón from the 1940s and 1950s. Um, Peronismo, the, the, the movement, um, is really the only organized political force in Argentina other than the military that has been able to hold on to power and govern for the last 80 years. Um, and it's an interesting movement. There, there, there's no way to talk about it here in you know, the, the 20 or 30 minutes I've got. Um, it really spans, like ideologically, it's, it's undefinable um, because it spans from genuine fascists on the far right wing of the party to um, kind of Cuba style Stalinist communists on the left. Um, and so it really contains everything, which is why it's the one party or the one movement um, that has been able to hold power in Argentina. Um, 
But what we see this movement do when it's in power um, is essentially kind of, in a, in a sense, kind of buy off all of the buy up all of the political space in the country um, through public spending. Right? They are able to kind of, 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 of hand out rewards, jobs, government positions, subsidies for businesses um, all across the country. The consequence of that, though, is uh, constantly high inflation, right? 50% um, inflation in Argentina, 50% annual inflation um, anymore is a pretty good year. I think right now it's running at about 100 or 120% um, inflation. And again, that's not unusual, right? And so it's kind of a, a consequence of this system. Um, every once in a while, Argentines get fed up with this um, and vote for somebody else. They vote the Peronists out. Um, inevitably, for the past 80 years, that government has, that new conservative government has either not been reelected or in many cases, not even been able to finish its term in power. They've been run out of office through one means or another, or the military has intervened um, to remove a government from power. So again, the Peronists tend to be politically popular, politically powerful, and because they've got really just a good classic political machine behind them. Um, but the consequences have been economically pretty disastrous. A um, hundred years ago, Argentina was the, one of the most prosperous, wealthy countries in the world. Um, nobody talks about Argentina in those terms today. Um, and largely, this is a, a result of Peronist government over the past 60 or 70 years, or at least their various terms in power. Um, and then the third category here are these social democracies. And again, like the other two categories, um, there's a lot of diversity here. They're not all exactly the same. Um, in this image, we see Gabriel Boric uh, on the left, the current president of Chile, uh, Gustavo Petro, the current president of Colombia. And on the right, uh, we see the recently re-inaugurated president of Brazil, um, Lula. So um, when we talk about social democracies, um, Again, we're talking about kind of a different version of the left. Um, I tend to think of them as governments that mostly respect the rules of democracy, right? They don't try to overturn the system. They don't try to play with the election rules. They don't try to stack the judicial system. Um, and they also mostly respect market economics. The second part here is key. Sometimes I think it's because they believe in them or they have come around to believing in the value of democracy and, and free markets. Or sometimes I think they realize that they just don't have the power to change it, right? That they have no choice but to live within these constraints. And so we can kind of look at them as attempts to build European style welfare, welfare states um, in an environment where there are simply fewer resources, right? Um, Colombia is not Germany, right? Um, so, it, or, or Chile is not France, right? So trying to build um, again, kind of a, a classic European style welfare state that can take care, um, that can provide kind of social insurance for the population, um, but in an environment where there just are far fewer resources uh, to go around. So in practice, again, what do these governments look like? Um, again, we can kind of divide them up and see how they're the same and different. Uh, if we look at Chile under Gabriel Boric, the current president, um, he's only been in power for about a year. Um, he's a young guy. I believe he's 36 or 37 now. And he got his political start as a student activist. Um, Chile is an interesting country in, in some ways very similar to the U.S. in that um, the cost of higher education and even high school education, a, a decent high school education, um, can be quite high. Um, and so students are forced to borrow lots of money. Families are forced to borrow lots of money, uh, make all sorts of other economic sacrifices in order for students to go to school. Oftentimes these schools aren't really all that fantastic, um, but people feel like they have to send their kids there in order to kind of get them moving up the, the social ladder. Um, the result is that students are often getting poor educations. Um, they don't have good job prospects when they get out and they have lots of debt. Um, unlike in the United States, Chilean students have been really, really well organized, right? I mean, you, you see the, the, the push, for example, in the US for student loan forgiveness um, really seems to be coming kind of from the top, right, from, from leaders in the Democratic Party thinking that this is a good idea. Um, in Chile, it very much comes from the bottom up. Um, for at least a decade, maybe more, um, there have been round after round after round of massive protests in Chile um, demanding that different governments um, do something to address the cost of education. Gabriel Boric was a leader in that movement. So he got his political start as, a, as an activist. Um, but at a really, really massive scale, right? The student movement is one of the most important movements in the country. Um, 
So he kind of comes from it, within Chilean politics, kind of a more radical, further left tendency. Um, but I put him in this kind of social democratic category um, because I think the second point here is crucial, right? Chile has a strong private sector. Um, the business community in Chile is very organized, um, very well represented within the key institutions of government. And political parts, uh, conservative political parties in Chile um, are still pretty strong. So in other words, there are real barriers on what President Boric can do. Um, and whether he likes it or not, he's realized this the hard way. Um, one of his campaign promises when he came to power, or when he was campaigning, um, was that Chileans need to just start over in their political system and rewrite the whole constitution. Um, and so they had a constitutional assembly, they elected people to write the constitution, um, and then they had to send it out to be ratified by the voters. Um, everything seemed to be moving smoothly for President Boric. They, they elected delegates to the constitutional assembly. They wrote a new constitution, which was probably the most progressive constitution in the region. Um, and then they submitted it to voters, I believe, early last year or late the year before, late 2020, maybe. Um, and it failed about 60-40, right? It was rejected. Uh, and so Chile still has the old constitution. They're still working on amendments and ways to, to, to change it. Um, but so President Boric has run headfirst um, really into the limitations of his power. So I, I think if he were the king of Chile or the dictator of Chile, um, things could look very different. Um, but kind of given the constellation of power in Chile, he's really pretty limited in what he's been able to do. Um, and so for that reason, I kind of put him in this social democratic category, right? Even if his intentions um, might be more to the left, he's really been very hemmed in by political reality. Um, Colombia, I think, is one of the most interesting uh, places in the region right now. Um, I mean, Colombia's all, all always been an interesting place. Um, but Gustavo Petro, the current president, was elected last year. Um, so just recently took office within the past year. Um, he got his political start um, as a Marxist guerrilla, uh, uh, essentially a communist uh, fighter um, during Colombia's long civil war. Um, so his political start um, was you know, by taking up arms in a war in his country, um, but then shifted into civilian politics. He's been the mayor of Bogota, the capital city. Um, he's twice been a, sen a senator. Um, so again, he's kind of been on, on, on both sides of this. He's been a violent revolutionary, um, but he's also been a civilian politician. Um, interestingly here, he's the first leftist president in Colombia's history. Um, Colombia historically has been a deeply conservative country, at least in its politics. Um, and the left has never won um, the presidency in Colombia or never been able to take power in Colombia. Um, and in some ways, he's running into the same issues that President Boric is running into in um, Chile, uh, which is that Colombia has legal and economic institutions that I would call, they're not ideal, but I would say they're moderately effective um, at restraining executive overreach, right? Colombian presidents just can't do whatever they want. Um, and so Petro has been in some ways kind of careful not to overreach, um, in part because I think he knows that some version of what happened to Boric in Chile um, could happen to him as well, right? The Colombian legal and economic system um, just puts real limits on what he's able to do. Um, also, like Chile, Colombia has a very, very strong private sector um, that limits his room for maneuver, right? Um, many of these leftist presidents, uh, again, out of ideological conviction or just out of convenience, have realized that if you want to redistribute wealth within your country, there must be wealth to redistribute, and that the private sector has become the engine of economic growth. Um, and so, again, they, they can marginally raise taxes, they can do all sorts of things to try and redistribute resources at the margins, um, but we're not seeing the kind of really aggressive economic moves in Colombia or in Chile. Um, I would also say for, for folks like Pedro, given his background um, and given Colombia's history, um, there's also a, a certain conservatism built into the left um, around this history of violence, right? There have been a lot of leftist leaders and leftist politicians in Colombia's history. Um, it's not that the left has never been present or never been viable, um, but often their leaders have been killed. Um, and so Gustavo Petro is very, very much aware, um, I think, of that. Um, I don't think the fear is as great as it would have been 20 or 30 years ago, um, but it is not an unreasonable fear um, in a place like Colombia, um, where political violence is still... Um, unfortunately, more common um, than it is in other parts of the world. 
Um, and then our last uh, social democrat um, is President Lula, who's actually coming back around for a second, actually a third term. He won two terms um, earlier in the century from 2003 to 2010, um, and then was just recently reelected. Um, but I think his governments are going to look very different, or this government is going to look very different than the first time around. Um, his first presidency, um, his party had pretty healthy legislative majorities, right? so he could push things through Congress um, because he had the votes. Um, again, this was also the period of a commodities boom. Um, Brazil is a substantial oil producer. It's a huge agricultural country. During his first time in office, prices of all that stuff was high, and so he had money to play with. Um, and so he was able to advance a lot of his agenda. Um, by the time he left office and by the time his successor left office, um, Brazil had been kind of mired in corruption scandals that I think tainted his legacy. Um, a, a decent percentage of Brazilians kind of view him as corrupt or at least as someone who didn't stand up to corruption. Um, but amongst large chunks of the population, he remains popular. Um, evidence of that, I think you look at his successor, I'm sorry, his predecessor right now, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, um, in many ways his polar opposite ideologically and politically um, actually continued most of his economic policies um, that were geared toward redistributing wealth um, in favor of the poor, right? So um, Bolsonaro came in as a, as a big critic of, of Lula, um, but actually never really undid many of the economic reforms that Lula had put in place a decade earlier, right? Um, and then I think the big thing that's going to limit Lula, just like it has limited some of these other folks I've been talking about, um, is economic reality, right? From 2003 to 2010, during his first presidency, um, he had money to play with. He had resources. Um, and so he could make a lot of decisions. He could push an agenda forward. Um, the Brazilian economy is far, far weaker today. Um, commodity prices are way lower. He just doesn't have the money to play with. Um, and so almost by definition, this is going to be um, sort of a, a more moderate, more conservative version of Lula um, than what we saw 15 or 20 years ago. Oops. Um, okay, as I mentioned, I'll do this one quick. Um, you know, we, we, we see various versions of the left in power throughout the region. What does that mean? We don't see a lot of right-wing governments, um, but we do see that the conservative groups aren't, um, they haven't just gone away, right? They haven't just kind of laid down um, and rolled over. Um, and I think we see kind of two interesting things happening here. Um, on the left, you see President Guillermo Lasso, uh, the current president of Ecuador. Um, he came to power a year ago um, through democratic elections after about 15 years um, under one of these kind of populist leftist governments. Um, the entire period of that previous government, Lasso was one of the loudest, uh, most vocal, most organized critics of that, that government under Rafael Correa. The, the previous president. Um, he ran against him twice. Um, even when President Correa was wildly popular and Lasso knew that he would lose, right? He was the, the, the one that showed up, right? Um, he was the one who showed up as an opposition alternative um, to one of these populist leftist governments. Um, and then in 2020, I'm sorry, 2019, um, actually finally broke through and won. Um, and so again, he's kind of a classic um, conservative. Right, he is um, a former banker, a big business guy, a very wealthy man, um, a kind of classic fiscal conservative. So again, the, the, the right is not out of power everywhere. Um, and I do think depending on how successful he is, um, really could serve as a model for conservative resurgence in the region. Um, on the right, I, we see something that I think is more unfortunate, um, which is um, a, a kind of a, a mob of Brazilian um, activists, let's call them, um, attacking their own capital after Lula was sworn into power, um, so after he returned to, to the presidency. So these are supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro um, that violently attacked the capital um, in opposition to the current president. Um, so I put these two up here side by side um, to kind of make the argument that both of these tendencies are, are present um, in right-wing or conservative politics in Latin America today, right? There is kind of the old school country club, conservative businessman type Guillermo Lasso, um, there is also, um, you know, a, a kind of violent insurrectionist tendency um, in some other countries, right? So um, I think we have to take both of these seriously. They are both real. Just a couple more things here. Um, I put this slide up here um, because I don't know. I put El Salvador with a question mark because I have no idea uh, really how to categorize them. 
um, in terms of this left-right spectrum. The current president, his name is Nayib Bukele, um, you can see him there on the left, has been in office since 2019. Um, I say he's hard to categorize because his real um, kind of claim to, to a political mandate has been being tough on crime, um, which isn't necessarily kind of a left or a right wing idea. Um, El Salvador historically for the past 20 years has been one of the most violent countries in the world, one of the highest murder rates in the world. Um, and his record on crime has been absolutely ruthless. Um, here you can see on the right, um, prisoners just lined up. This is actually at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so they got masks, um, but certainly that is not, um, you know, kind of no social distancing happening there. These guys are handcuffed, stripped down um, and, and sitting in a prison. Um, so th this tough on crime approach has been absolutely brutal. Um, you know, I, I don't have much optimism that any of those guys sitting on that floor there uh, got a fair trial in El Salvador. Um, that said, he has been wildly popular. Um, crime rates have come down in El Salvador. Um, he pitches himself, th these are his words, not mine, as the world's coolest dictator. Um, so again, he's not even kind of trying to hide his intentions um, of staying in power. And you can tell from the photo, um, maybe two things, right? One is he's young. Um, he's about 40 years old. Um, and the second is he does very much pitch himself as kind of the cool guy, right? He shows up to work um, in jeans and a t-shirt and a backward baseball cap. Um, but to give you an idea of where things might be headed here, um, about a year ago, again, in terms of, of, of ramping up this war on crime, um, sent a bill to Congress um, asking them to approve more money for the military, for security, for a variety of things. Um, there was real resistance in Congress to approving all of the extra, both, both the money and the policy, right? Again, as you can see from the, the photo on the left, um, in order to get this pushed through Congress, um, Bukele showed up to Congress for the vote, um, surrounded by about 200 heavily armed soldiers, right? So again, the message here is, is, is clear, right? You will do this, um, or I've got guys with guns behind me that will encourage you or force you to do it. Um, so again, I don't know where to put him on the ideological spectrum, um, but I think he's likely someone that's gonna be around uh, for a while. Um, Last thing, or next to last thing, um, what I was calling kind of the chaotic countries. And we see kind of two things happening here. One is a political crisis in Peru. Um, they've been through about 10 presidents in the last 10 years, right? Many of these presidents have ended up in jail, rightly or wrongly. Um, a former president has committed suicide um, as the police were showing up to arrest him. Again, rightly or wrongly, whether he was uh, about to be arrested, I think that's debatable. Um, and we saw the current, or I'm sorry, the, the most recent president, Pedro Castillo, which who's in the, the image on top, um, had been president for about a year, was, um, I would say, kind of a sloppy president, didn't accomplish very much, campaigned as a leftist, um, but really just didn't do much at all, um, had most of his agenda blocked, um, just wasn't very good, I would say wasn't very good at the job, regardless of his ideology. Um, he was afraid that he was about to be impeached. I think he was about to be impeached. Um, and so staged probably one of the sloppiest coups I've ever seen in my experience in Latin America. Um, and within a couple of hours, he had been arrested, imprisoned, um, and then impeached, right? And so the political crisis just continues to cycle. Um, and there really isn't any um, obvious sign to me about what the exit to this, this crisis is. Um, and so I'll leave that part there. If there are questions, I, uh, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, the other kind of chaotic country or crisis here um, is the situation in Venezuela, which I suspect many of you are familiar with. Um, again, in part due to economic policies in Venezuela, in part due to U.S. sanctions on the country, um, the economy has simply imploded. Um, Venezuela used to be one of the most prosperous countries in the region. Um, a couple of years ago, they had one million percent inflation. Um, to give you a sense of what that means, um, so I, I, I spend quite a bit of time in Colombia. Um, the, on the streets of Colombia, there are lots and lots of Venezuelan people who have fled their country. Um, you can buy little handbags and coin purses and all sorts of things um, that are essentially made out of Venezuelan currency used as origami to make stuff, right? In other words, it's more, like, the money is so useless, it's actually better just to use it to make, um, you know, a nice colorful purse or a, a, a change bag or something. Um, now, I say that was a few years ago. I think the situation in Venezuela has started to stabilize uh, for some odd reasons. Um, one, in a country with a million percent inflation, people just give up on their own currency. They stop using it. Um, and so the country has effectively dollarized. Right? The dollar is the dominant currency in Venezuela, which means inflation has started to come down dramatically. 
Um, the other piece of this is that the economic crisis has so hollowed out the government, has so undermined government institutions, um, that there isn't much left in terms of the government's ability to take over businesses, to regulate businesses. So in a really weird way, they kind of come full circle to being a very free market economy because the government simply can't do anything anymore, right? And then lastly, I'll finish up here. I'm just looking ahead, things to think about. Um, that commodities boom from a decade ago really was driven by growth in China um, for all of these minerals and agricultural products. Um, growth slowed in China and then kind of ground to a halt during the COVID pandemic. Um, and that took the wind out of the sails of many Latin American economies. Um, the question is what happens when China reopens after its zero COVID uh, strategy, right? If the Chinese economy bounces back strong, I think we could see a, a big upsurge in economies in Latin America that will carry politicians with them. Um, that gets me to my second point, what happens to commodity prices? Um, and will these new leaders have the resources to pursue their goals, right? Right now, many of them are blocked um, simply in terms of they don't have money, right? Um, they have to be tight-fisted economically because they don't have an alternative. Um, and then lastly, um, can precarious democratic institutions hold up? Um, in several of the countries we've talked about here, um, you know, there are real political challenges to basic institutions of government, whether it's the presidency in Peru, um, whether it's um, AMLO in Mexico tinkering with the election system and the judicial authorities, um, several other cases as well. Um, will these democratic institutions be able to hold up and, and, and kind of see us through to meaningful democratic elections again in the future? Um, I'm optimistic, but um, things can go wrong. Um, so I will leave it at that. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm sorry if I got a little long winded. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take those. Great. Thank you so much for um, your presentation and your talk. I found it really interesting. I think our audience has as well. And we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, I will sort of go through those. Um, and then I've got a few of my own that I will work at sprinkle in uh, as more potentially come in from the audience. Uh, so the first question that we got was, uh, what do you think about tourism in South America? Uh, Colombia has been sort of out of bounds for tourists for so long. Do you think it's safer now uh, under the new regime? Or, or can you tell us a little bit about your experiences uh, there since you've spent so much time there? Um, uh, Colombia's back. I mean, in terms of security, I, I uh, maybe this is too cynical, um, but but what I tell people is like, I, I live in St. Louis. Um, if you can live in St. Louis, you can handle Colombia. Um, I mean, there are, there are obvious security problems in certain parts of the country. Um, there are places you don't want to go at night, um, but the tourism industry, tourism is now one of the leading um, economic sectors in Colombia and has been for a while. Um, the Pacific coast um, gets tons of tourists. Bogota um, is booming with tourists. The Medellin region, which really used to be off limits like during the Pablo Escobar era, um, is open for business. Um, Colombia is overflowing with tourists. Obviously that all crashed uh, with the COVID pandemic, um, that is coming back. I think maybe the, so I, so on the Colombia side, um, absolutely with some precautions. Um, the one place we're seeing problems right now on that front is in Peru um, with the constant cycle of political crises and protests. Um, a lot of the, pro uh, some of these protesters have shut down Machu Picchu, which is the big tourist draw in Peru. Um, and so I think that's having um, really bad economic consequences in a big tourism region. Um, but as far as Colombia goes, um, open for business. The security situation is better than it's been in my lifetime. Um, I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to the current president. It's just an ongoing phenomenon. Um, but no, pack your bags and go. Great. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for that question, Kim. Um, our next question comes from Terry. Um, does our continuing 50 year plus relationship with Cuba make any sense to you or to anyone? Uh, so I'm going to assume that there, that Terry is talking about um, the sort of sanctions blockade, basically completely isolating ourselves from Cuba. Yeah. Um, is that a policy that seems to be working or not? No, I mean, that, that's the easiest question of the day. Um, no, it, it hasn't made sense for 20 or 30 years. In terms of foreign policy, it makes sense in terms of domestic politics in the U.S. Um, and I think in a, in a strange way, there's actually, I, I'm a little bit optimistic here. Um, I, this will, I don't know, depending on people's political sensibilities, 
um, in the in this most recent midterm election in the U.S., um, Democrats got rocked in Florida, right? I mean, the Republicans won across the board by a lot. Um, and what has really driven U.S. policy towards Cuba has been the efforts of both parties to compete for votes in, in particularly in Miami-Dade County in the Cuban community that tends to want a very hardline policy towards Cuba. Um, and to the extent that Florida becomes a one-party state, I think a lot of that pressure kind of dissipates, right? If Democrats simply give up on Florida, then we can have, at least on one side, um, a more rational policy towards Cuba. Um, because, yeah, just objectively, we've been doing the same thing for 50 years and it doesn't work. Um, so it makes no sense at all. Okay, uh, great. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question that sort of overlaps. Um, one of the questions that I was going to ask. Um, so you mentioned that several countries in the region are experiencing population loss. At the same time, we have an immigration crisis in the U.S., um, crisis in quotes, um, where are the majority of people leaving and would you, how would you classify those people? Are they migrants? Are they asylum seekers? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a human rights person. So I, I tend to think of people leaving for political and, you know, economic persecution as asylum seekers. It's a d ongoing debate, I think in immigration policy. So can you speak a little bit uh, in broad terms about, about that and the population loss, how it affects the U.S., how it affects neighboring countries in the region? Yeah, there's a, a bunch of pieces to that. Um, so I think on the, on, the, on, the, my, on the immigration side in the U.S., um, I mean, a lot of this really is um, a, a result of a dysfunctional immigration system that our politicians have not been, I would argue, have not been willing to sort out. I think there are um, political reasons on, on both sides of the aisle, why, why it's better to leave the situation as it is. Um, so at a technical level, many of these folks are arriving as asylum seekers, um, in part because of the dysfunction of the U.S. immigration system, that, that um, the most likely path to entry into the U.S. is to show up and ask for asylum. Um, then we have to think about U.S. asylum law and who qualifies under it and who doesn't, and then there's a million debates there um, and every case is, is unique. So I, I don't know that I can say much about that. Um, in terms of where people are leaving from, I would put them in kind of two general, but where they're leaving from and why they're leaving. I might put them in two general categories, maybe three. Um, one, there has been um, just kind of the normal historic flow of workers um, from Mexico migrating to the U.S. Um, legally or not, um, with papers or without. Some of them stay, some of them migrate seasonally. Right? So that, there's nothing new there. That's a, a constant historically for the past 60 or 80 years. Um, there are folks fleeing um, really, really hellish levels of violence in places like Guatemala and Honduras. Um, somebody asked a second ago about you know, the, the, the embargo on Cuba and whether that makes any sense. No, it doesn't. If there's a dumber policy in terms of kind of self-interest, um, then the Cuban embargo is probably the war on drugs, right? It just hasn't, it doesn't work. Um, whatever one thinks about drugs, um, it has not been effective. Um, but that is what's driving violence in, um, particularly in Guatemala and Honduras, to a lesser extent, El Salvador, um, is that um, really the drug gangs have outgunned their own governments. Um, so it isn't that they've taken over the government, it's that they've simply outgunned them. Um, and so people are fleeing violence, not from their government, but from drug traffickers uh, and, and assorted gangs. Um, and then the third piece is something I mentioned earlier, um, which is economic collapse, uh, particularly in Venezuela. I mean, it is shocking to travel around the region. Um, everywhere you go, uh, there are large numbers of, of Venezuelans um, all over the region. Many of them um, eventually make it to the U.S., but you can go to anywhere in any city in Colombia, any city in Ecuador, um, and you'll find large numbers of Venezuelans, um, which is just shocking. I mean, you go back even 20 years. Um, Colombia was a country that was exporting tons and tons of people because of violence there. Many of them went to Venezuela um, and the flow of people has just 100 degrees, 180 degrees, I guess, reversed. Um, and so it's the biggest refugee crisis in, in Latin American history that I'm aware of, the Venezuelan problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got one more question in the chat box and then I'm going to take the last opportunity to ask the last question and further abuse my privileges as moderator <laughs> because I found this really interesting. Forget. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kenneth Warren in the chat, 
um, asks, what is the difference between Trump undermining elections and tinkering with the courts to try to benefit him versus what's going on with some leaders in Latin America? Nothing. Um, in terms of the attempt, absolutely nothing. Where This is the same thing. Um, the difference is um, 240 years of, of um, more or less functional democratic institutions that have competent independent people in them um, in the U.S. Um, and in other places, that's just not true. Democracy is younger, it's weaker, it's more fragile. The people running elections and, and, and judges um, and court systems um, are newer, are more vulnerable, are, are more open to attack. Um, and so it's easier to get away with. Um, in, in most other countries. But in terms of the the in terms of what is happening and the intentions behind it, I this is the same thing to me. Okay. Um, thank you for that strong statement uh, in support of democracy. I appreciate that. Um, so we've got one more comment here in the chat that actually lines up uh, really well with what my question was going to be. Um, and the comment in the chat is if you think Peru is in chaos, try Haiti. I wanted to try to draw some parallels, right? Um, Haiti recently had a president assassinated functionally by cartels um, and organized crime. Uh, I'm wondering if we can maybe make some comparisons with Mexico and El Salvador, which are um, certainly states where cartels have a lot of power and a lot of uh, influence. You mentioned that El Salvador's president was taking a very hard line stance on crime, I'm assuming most of that is targeted at the cartels. Um, has there been major pushback um, from the cartels there, which are some of the more dangerous cartels in the world? Can you provide a little bit more context um, there? Yeah, so let me take a couple of pieces of that. Um, I mean, the Haiti situation, this is this is uh, bad on my part. Um, when I talk about these issues, I, I tend not to talk a lot about Haiti. First, I don't know a lot. Uh, and it's just not a place I've spent much time um, but also Haiti has been in crisis um, for at least 30 years, um, if not longer. Um, and so I, I guess I was thinking in terms of relatively recent crises and in, in, in chaos. And so the the whoever put that comment out there is absolutely right. If we're talking about chaos in Peru, check out Haiti. Um, and the difference here, I, what was one of the issues between thinking about cartels and all these different countries um, really is, I mean, the cartels are relatively similar, or their behavior is, is relatively similar. Um, what is different is the governments that they're confronting. Um, and so, again, the, the government in Haiti is just kind of almost collapsed, right? There almost isn't a government. And so um, what was kind of shocking was how, from what I know about it, how easy it was um, for essentially a, a group of assassins to sneak into the country, walk right up to the president and kill him. Um, in El Salvador or in Mexico, um, in different ways, we see governments trying to stand up with some level of success. Um, in El Salvador, again, like I mentioned, it's been brutal. Uh, I mean, like if you are a human rights person, El Salvador is not your place and Bukele is not your guy. Um, there is zero respect for due process, rule of law, that kind of stuff. Um, that being said, um, it does seem like crime rates have come down. Um, and the flow of drugs. I mean, if you look at Central America, there are lots of routes to get from South America to North America. Um, people are starting to avoid El Salvador. Um, so do with that what you what you will. Um, on the Mexican front then, uh, it, it is the power of the cartels, the violence of the cartels, and then there's the corruption piece um, because we see the Mexican government um, when it wants to act against cartels, um, it can. Right. So like a couple of weeks ago, Biden was going to Mexico City for a big summit. Um, and like a week before, the Mexican government arrested the son of El Chapo, um, who is basically running his dad's old business. Um, they could have arrested him at any time, I suspect. Um, right. If they, But they were able to do it at that moment to, to have somebody to show, um, you know, the visiting president from the U.S., hey, look at what we did. Um, so I think that the cartels are similar. I think what's what's more interesting in looking at the power that they have is the governments that they that they run up against. 
Thank you. That's that's really interesting. Uh, we have one final. I'll I'll make this the last question. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I would probably continue this for hours if I was not going to be respectful. But I really uh, appreciate everybody being here. So one last question from the chat. Um, what implications do you think the tendency of leftists to rein in their sort of goals um, during poor economic conditions, what, does that what effect does that have on the attractiveness of the leftist movement in the region? Are they able to sort of use that and be like, no, we're responsible leftists, um, you can trust us yeah. to be, you know, physically responsible, or does that sort of undercut their claims of redistribution? Yeah, I, I think in the short term, it, 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 most of these leaders who are doing that um, try very hard to make the fiscal responsibility argument, right? To kind of make a virtue out of a problem. Um, and so, so for example, like attacks on a lot of these leftist governments have called them Castro Chavistas, right? They're, they want to they're wanna be Hugo Chavez and, and Fidel Castro. And these leaders will very, very adamantly, like, no, 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 right? I'm on the left. Maybe I even share some of their ideals, but we're not going to do what Venezuela and Cuba did. Um, I, I think that work in a democratic context, it works for them for a while. Um, eventually, if people are voting because they want housing and hospitals and schools, and that's what they want. Um, and so oftentimes when we see after these kind of waves of left-wing governments, when we see conservative governments come back to power, it really is exactly for that reason, right? A lot of people have simply given up and said, oh, they're just liars like everybody else, right? They promised us all this stuff and they didn't deliver. Um, and so we'll vote for this other guy. Um, so I think there's a, a little bit of both of those things happening. Okay. Um, well, like I said, I, I will make that the last question. I do think we could continue this for quite a while. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Professor Bowen, for your time and your expertise and your wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to stop everything there with a brief plug for the next Great Decisions uh, event on February 16th from 12 to uh, 1.30, uh, which will be on um, economic warfare. So if you are interested in sanctions or tariffs and, or how countries use economic power to get what they want, um, this, is the, um, this is the event for you. Uh, it will be a can't miss event. Um, I also will plug one more time. Again, these quality programs can only happen because of the support of World Affairs members. So please become a member of the World Affairs Council of St. Louis today uh, or encour encourage the organization that you are with to become a member uh, if you don't want to pay out of pocket on your own. Um, so uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, I believe we have a brief video to play um, that provides a little bit more context on goings on in Latin America uh, that we will run sort of without panel discussion or anything else like that if you are interested in more information and, and wanna hang around. Uh, again, thank you, Professor Bowen, um, so much for your time. Yep, thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Great Decisions. We begin the second half of this eight lecture masterclass by turning our attention to politics in Latin America with a particular focus on democracy development and recent elections. There are three main considerations that we will take before considering U.S. foreign policies towards the region. We'll look at Latin America before the emergence of democracy, We'll consider Latin American political tides, and then finally, we'll take a look at contemporary elections. Globally speaking, democracy has risen in a series of waves. The first wave happened shortly after World War I with a sharp uptick in the number of democracies. There was a second wave after the Second World War, and then finally, a third wave occurred in the aftermath of the Cold War. The trend in waves of democracy looks something like this. A major event occurs. It could be something profoundly bad, like a world war, or something quite good, such as the peaceful end of the Cold War that leads to a rise in democracy, a democratic wave. Then there is a crest, followed by decline. 
as we look at the world democratically speaking and categorizing countries by the degree of democracy, we do note a couple of troubling trends in our hemisphere. Mexico has been downgraded lately from a flawed democracy to a hybrid regime, and the United States has suffered five consecutive downgrades in its democratic status. Once a full democracy, according to The Economist, the United States is now a flawed democracy. Looking more specifically at Latin America and where it stands in these global waves of democracy, it was in the late 1980s and through the early part of the 21st century that most of the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean transitioned from authoritarianism to a democracy. If we were to create a hierarchy of democracies south of the border, without doubt, Costa Rica and Uruguay are at the top impressive in their democratic systems. At the bottom, we have countries like Cuba and Haiti, Nicaragua and Venezuela, clearly non-democracies. And then most of the other countries in the region, including Mexico, are either flawed or hybrid democracies. We begin by looking at Latin America pre-democracy, and that of course is the era of colonization. The Europeans arrived, most notably the Iberians, Spain, and Portugal, and came to dominate most of the region in search of cheap labor and also exportable resources. When the Napoleonic campaigns began in early 19th century Europe, the countries that dominated Latin America were gravely weakened. They prioritized the war in Europe over their colonial possessions in our hemisphere. And as a result of that, many of the countries of South America became independent nations in the 1820s. While becoming independent from Europe, the Latin American countries were not able to secure their independence from the other major power, the United States, which had clear aims and intentions towards the region. In 1823, the United States announced the Monroe Doctrine, stating that this region should be free and clear of European influence. By 1904, the Roosevelt Corollary regarded the region as one where the U.S. had the right to intervene militarily as necessary to preserve our interests. So what is it about American interventions? Nicaragua alone was invaded nine times by the United States in the 1900s. Other countries also were targeted. One of our purposes was to attain great power status. A great power is a particularly large and impressive country that wins most of its military battles and defines its interests continentally, if not globally. It is also a power that is accepted into the great power club by other members of that club. In order to gain entrance, the United States believed it needed to dominate the region of the Western Hemisphere. We break through in 1898 by defeating Spain in the Spanish-American War and attaining great power status. To establish regional dominance was certainly one of the principal aims of U.S. interventions in the region, to secure allies in governments across South America and the Caribbean, and finally to prevent European intrusions moving forward. When we look at Latin America today and ask them basic questions, where is the most influence coming from? Is it the United States? Is it China or some other? The United States is still the one most point to. We are the dominant influence in the region, but look at how quickly China has emerged. It's now number two in ranking and closing in on the United States. A few years ago, a great decision was China in Latin America, where we focused exclusively on Chinese investments, loans, and political inroads in Latin America and the Caribbean. We asked Latin American citizens, who do you trust more? And while the United States is still number one at 56, look at how close on a scale of zero to 100, the members of Latin America look at China. They view it as being as trustworthy nearly as the United States. And finally, we ask countries in Latin America, what is your role model? 
how would you like your country to develop both politically and economically? Again, on a scale of zero to 100, the United States barely breaks 30 in a single country in the region. That, of course, is our southern neighbor, Mexico. Most other countries have very little faith in the American political and economic model. The transition to democracy in Latin America is thoroughly impressive. If we go back to the late 1970s, there are only a handful of countries, marked here in blue, that we would label as democratic. By 2000, almost every country in the region was viewed as democratic, with Mexico in 2000 joining the club for the first time. The political tides of Latin America have changed over the decades. We've seen a red tide after World War II, followed by a black tide, a pink tide in the 1990s, and now today we see political decay, declining democratic status, and what is referred to as a gray tide, as reflected in national elections. We begin with the red tide, that of course represents communism, and the primary advocate of that early on was Fidel Castro of Cuba. Castro led a peasant movement similar to what we saw in China in 1945 under Mao. He rejected the elites that ran the show in Havana that invited the Western investors and property owners. He sought at the center of his political platform social justice for all Cubans. The red tide that began with Castro did spread to places like Nicaragua, and as it did, we viewed those nations as proxies of the Soviet Union, because the red tide occurred within the context of the Cold War struggle. As a result, we directed ranging military, political, economic, and intelligence pressure on those governments. We saw them as adversaries, and we sought regime change in those countries. The red tide and America's response to it resulted in the black tide of Latin America. The black tide of Latin America is associated with brutal and repressive authoritarian regimes, governments that were closely aligned to and supported by the United States. Because we prioritize the struggle against communism over desires for democracy and social justice in the region. Having said that, the close alliance to the United States led to economic growth in most of those authoritarian regimes, which allowed them to stay in power for sustained periods of time. Third, we have the pink tide that occurred after the Cold War ended, where Latin America became democratized and immediately turned to the political left. Center left and far left candidates were successful in national elections. And because of that, we saw a more pro progressive and socialist agenda pursued. Many of the leaders of the Pink Tide, however, became rather rich and authoritarian over time. All power, Lord Acton reminds us, tends to corrupt, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. We saw that happening in the liberal movements in Latin America. Nowhere was it more evident than an Eva Morales in Bolivia. He was a poor cocoa leaf farmer. He was a social engager and activist. He became the president of Bolivia in 2006 and remained there until 2019. And while he advocated for the poor and pursued policies that would promote universal education, land rights, and economic opportunity, he benefited greatly from his position in power. When he stepped down, he had a net worth of $185 million. The people of Latin America see through this. They hear the words that they want to hear, namely social justice and opportunity for all, but they also witness the rapid concentration of wealth in the hands of those at the top. The gray tide is the most recent wave in Latin America. And while it's not the most troubling, clearly the red tide and black tide were more devastating for the region, it does have ominous implications moving forward. Because the gray tide is synonymous with public disenchantment with pop politics, 
People are losing faith in the political order and in democracy. They're growing gravely tired of the violence that's happening on their city streets, and they want a firm hand in office that can calm affairs at home and promote the interests of a stable country moving forward. And this means they're moving away from democracy. What we're seeing happening in Latin America with the gray tide is the decline of democracy that is synonymous with other waves of democracy, globally speaking. The four tides of Latin America, the red tide is now gone. The pink tide led to the gray tide, which now seems to be reverting back to something akin to the black tide, strong authoritarian leaders in place. So what's wrong with Latin America? What is hampering the region's democratic trend line? Low levels of public support in elected officials is first among all others. Then there are the anchors of history that just prevent Latin America from moving forward on the political spectrum. Those anchors include concentrations of power, militaries that are willing to jump in, overthrow democratically elected leaders as necessary, and low public participation in the political system. Income inequality is a major obstacle to democracy. When the vast majority of people don't own land, don't have economic wealth, they feel like the political order does not reflect their interest, therefore they don't want to participate. When they do, they have very little faith in the outcome. And then there is the crime and violence associated with Latin America these days, whether it is the drug lords of Mexico or the incredible violence in countries in Central America, not to mention the disaster that is Venezuela, there's a widespread concern over simple matters of safety. Therefore, many people in Latin America want a stronger government associated with a strong police force and a very capable military to maintain public order. Now we look at contemporary elections in the region. Since most all of Latin America has become democratic of late, there are a lot of elections happening each year. In 2020, we saw elections in these countries, 2021 in those, and in 2022, major elections happening in key countries like Brazil and Colombia. In the near future, 2023, more elections happening in Central and South America. In 2024 and 25, other elections will be happening. So there's a constant turnover of national government in Latin America. But what direction are these elections taking? In the period 20 to 2022, there have been many elections in Latin America. We can chart the results of those elections on a political or ideological spectrum, ranging from socialism on the left to the hard right. Three elections have resulted in centrist candidates, while a full eight elections in Latin America over this short time period have resulted in leftist governments taking power. Chile, which turned left in its recent election, has made an abrupt U-turn, turning on its new guard. Gabriel Boric, as you see here, a left-winger was elected in Chile at the age of 36, making him the youngest democratically elected leader in the world. He promised a new constitution, one that would anchor leftist principles, a constitution that was put up to national referendum and shot down by a near two to one majority of Chileans. They simply did not want the country to go that far left. Here we can see the outcome of many elections in Latin America between 2020 and 2022. The big election occurred more recently, and that, of course, is in Brazil. The face-off was between a current president on the left and a past president on the right, a scenario we may well see happen here in the United States in 2024. The incumbent sitting president is Jair Bolsonaro. He is from the hard right. Many refer to him as the Trump of Brazil if not the Trump of Latin America. He was elected in 2018 and faced re-election challenge in 2022 by a candidate from the left, 
whose name is Lula da Sevilla, otherwise known as Lula. Lula is left of center when he campaigns, he moves back to the right when he governs, and then goes back to the left when it's time for re-election. We know this because he was twice elected president of Brazil and reigned from 2003 until 2011. He has an impressive resume of leadership, of economic growth, of global popularity, and also an extended period in prison because he was convicted of corruption shortly after he left office. He was released from jail by a Supreme Court justice and that allowed him to run in 2022. Before the election occurred, the candidate on the right was already undermining the democracy of Brazil, claiming before the election occurred that fraud was happening, that the only way that he could lose is if the other side cheated by refusing to concede once the election was over and even hinting at violence should he lose the national election. The winner of this important election was Lula on the political left. So we add one more election to our ideological spectrum, Brazil goes there. However, as noted earlier, since Lula very often governs from the center, it's pretty safe to put Brazil in this category. What is clear is that Brazil is not going anywhere anytime soon, because while Lula won the national election, the political right dominates the parliament of Brazil, it's very unlikely that Lula will be able to force through much legislation in this third term in office. We now turn our attention to US foreign policy towards the region, and we do so by recognizing not all issues fall into the same category. There are those issues that we can do very little to change, namely the outcome of Latin American elections. But then there are issues where we can promote change. We can change our policy and improve our position in the region, and in so doing, our perception in Latin America may well improve. It is clear that we're in a battle for this region's heart, not only South and Central America, but the Caribbean as well. China has targeted our hemisphere. It provides enormous amounts of development loans, gifts to countries, and political support if they will either provide access to their resources, such as lithium or oil or natural gas, or if they don't have natural resources, many countries in the Caribbean qualify here, those countries will vote with China in international organizations, such as the United Nations. We as a nation cannot take this hemisphere for granted. James Reston, the famous New York Times editor and writer, once noted, Americans will do anything for Latin America except read about it. We need to change that behavior. We should study Latin America, learn about Latin America, understand its interests, its priorities, and its concerns, and alter our foreign policy in ways that change their perception of us. We cannot simply assume that China's rising clout in the region will decline. We must be proactive and win the battle for the hearts and the minds of the Latin American populations. So let's focus now on areas of policy that we can change. One of them is Cuba. We have sanctioned Cuba for more than 60 years. Almost no one in the world agrees with us or even understands why we do so. Our two neighbors, Canada and Mexico, wholeheartedly reject our approach to Cuba. The main reason our sanctions failed there is that other countries aren't joining us. But it's deeper than that. The goal of the sanctions in Cuba is not simple policy change from Havana, but regime change. We wanted the Castros gone. Today they are, but the Communist Party of Cuba still reigns supreme and so our sanctions continue unabated. U.S. policy towards Cuba hurts our relationship with all of Latin America and the Caribbean, and it pays virtually no dividends geostrategically, economically, or otherwise. Next is Brazil, a country that we had very close relationships with for the past four years. Now with the change to Lula, that may alter. Brazil is such a large and influential country, we should do everything in our power 
to remove many of the wrinkles in the fabric of the relationship. There's no logical reason for requiring Brazilians to have visas to enter the United States. And of course, they counter that by requiring Americans to purchase costly visas to enter Brazil. It's such a minor issue, but it undermines the ability of both populations to travel to the other and engage in people-to-people -people exchanges. The plight of migrants is a very real sore spot. When they flow out of Venezuela, out of Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico into the United States, our policies are viewed as inhumane. We're pushing them back across the Mexican border and forcing them to wait out our processing, living in squalor and abject danger of being assaulted by gangs and violent individuals. And then finally, there is our drug policy towards the region. We must acknowledge that we're a very big part of the problem. It is our demand of drugs that results in the massive flow of cocaine, marijuana, fentanyl, and other illegal substances through Mexico into the United States. We cannot simply blame those producers in those countries or the governments that enable them or look away as their policies allow for more drugs to flow to the United States. We need a more level-headed approach to our drug policy towards Latin America and the world in general. Shoring up these four areas would improve America's perception in Latin America and perhaps make us the role model that we really should be in this hemisphere. With that, I thank you again for joining me in this Great Decisions Master Class. In week number six, our attention turns to global famine. Stay engaged and make great decisions.